In this video, we will briefly explore the concept of quantum mechanics, its relevant in inorganic chemistry, and its role in the discovery of the electron. So we've already delved into the fundamental building blocks of matter, protons, neutrons, and electrons. We've also discussed aspects of their mass and charge. However, to truly grasp atomic behavior, we must turn our attention to quantum mechanics. Now I understand this might seem a bit daunting as quantum mechanics often appears as complex and intimidating in movies, but rest assured, it's actually not as bad as it seems. So let's delve into why quantum mechanics is crucial. Quantum mechanics provides the mathematical framework that describes how electrons behave within atoms influencing their interactions when atoms combine to form molecules. So in simpler terms, one way it can be thought of is as the physics of electrons at the atomic level, and it holds significant predictive power. So unlike classical physics, which you may be more familiar with, quantum mechanics reveals that electrons exist within electron clouds, which are regions of probability around the nucleus. They don't follow a defined path like planets orbiting the sun would. Instead, we describe them using wave functions that represent probabilities of their positions and energy states. So understanding these electron clouds and energy levels actually allows us to predict atomic structures, what reactions will occur, and therefore create new compounds. Inorganic chemistry therefore relies on this, and especially the electron clouds, so we can design and analyze compounds. Now let's explore the discovery of the electron. So in the late 19th century, J.J. Thomson was messing around investigating electricity in a vacuum. He observed that there were these rays emitted from a high voltage negative electrode. We call these cathode rays. When a negative or positive charge was applied to either end of these rays, it would bend in specific ways. So if a positive charge was on one side, the ray would actually bend towards the positive charge. And if it were a negative charge, it would bend away. Also, when a magnetic field was applied, the ray would bend towards the pole that was expected of something negative. So simply put, these discoveries led to the conclusion that cathode rays may actually consist of small negatively charged particles. And this relationship can therefore be described by the force exerted on a particle by a magnetic field equals the force required to curve the particle's path, expressed as EVB equals MV squared over R, where E is the charge of the ray, V is the velocity, R is radius, M is mass, and B is magnetic field. So, an analogy I've created to help think about this is to imagine a guy pulling a car. In this case, the guy is the magnetic field that will exert the force, and the car is the cathode ray. So imagine that E, or the charge, is the height of the guy. So it's a defined discrete value. You know, if your height is six foot, it's six foot. It doesn't change to seven foot the next day. Imagine that V is the speed at which he pulls the car, and imagine B is the strength at which he pulls it. But the car also has a mass called M. It has an exponential speed, which is V squared, and this mass and speed are traveling on a path, which is R. So the guy must be tall enough, fast enough, and pull with enough strength to pull the car 
of a certain mass exponential velocity over a specific radius. So if you increase or decrease the guy's height or speed at which he pulls or strength at which he pulls, the path of the car will change. So you might be able to see how this is in this interesting relationship can actually be used to measure things like the electron's mass or its charge. Because if the variables such as magnetic field or the guy's strength are known by this equation, other quantities can be worked out. And this is exactly what was done. An easier way to actually do this is to use electric fields instead of velocity because this variable is relatively easily measurable. Just like we discussed that the magnetic force can curve the path of the ray, an electric force needed to pull it back to a straight line such as a positive charge can also be used. We can say therefore that electric force needed for a path to be straight is equal to the magnetic force because if they don't equal and the magnetic force is greater, it may curve towards the magnet. Or if the electric force is greater, it will curve towards the electric field. But if they are equal, the line will be straight. Therefore, we can say that lowercase e times capital E equals EVB, where capital E is electric field. And upon rearranging this, we get V or velocity equals E over B or electric field over magnetic field. So rearranging the first equation to get electron to mass ratio, which is useful information we want to know, we can actually substitute V for E over B, which is again an easier quantity to measure. So we get the equation E over M or charge over mass equals E over B squared times R or electric field over magnetic field squared times R. So Thomson was able to accelerate these rays through a known electric and magnetic field measuring their path ratio to determine the charge to mass ratio, which was found to be 1.76 times 10 to the 11th coulombs per kilogram. And from this, these cathode rays were soon recognized as electrons. So this guy called Robert Milken conducted experiments to measure the charge on the electron by suspending an oil droplet of known mass between parallel plates. Measuring the charge of each droplet, he observed that it was always a multiple of the smallest charge. So the accepted value of E was therefore determined to be 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs, which allows us to then calculate the electron's mass by rearranging this previous equation which gives us the value 9.11 times 10 to the negative 31 kilograms. So since then, many experiments have been conducted measuring these quantities we've talked about today, further confirming the parameters of an electron. So overall, it's important to understand that these discoveries underscored a significant concept that charge and mass are quantized, meaning they have specific discrete values. This property of quantization is crucial and is where the term quantum in quantum mechanics actually originates. So if there's anything to take away from everything I've talked about today, start to think about how things at a quantum level are quantized or have discrete values. So that's it for the video. I hope you've gained valuable insights from this discussion. 
If you have any questions or find any parts confusing, please feel free to leave a comment. In our next video, we will briefly explore black body radiation and the photoelectric effect. So thank you for watching. Until next time.